All right. Well, <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming to another introduction to computer graphics lecture. Um, all right. So we're going to talk about some interesting stuff today, and this is going to be our third lecture. Um, hopefully, my video is a little better. I'm using a new device now, so I have a slightly better setup. Uh, hopefully things are just a little bit improved for you. I'm going to make more improvements as, as we move along. So let's start today's lecture. That's going to be um, that's going to be about raster images. So we're going to talk about raster images. We're going to learn what they are and how to form them and all that stuff. All right. So pretty basic stuff. Again, we're kind of starting slow. Ah, uh, so an image. What's an image? So you see this. That's an image, right? So what is this made out of? You think? Uh, probably those of you who are familiar with graphics are thinking, "Oh, pixels! Yay!" And those of you who are not familiar with graphics are probably saying, "Oh, it's a stop sign. There's stop. There's make. There's an octagon. Whatever." <laughs> Uh, those of you who are familiar with graphic are wrong in this case because there are no pixels here. This is what we call a vector image. It's actually an SVG file. It's a, SVG is an excellent format. I would really highly recommend you to check it out and, and use it frequently. It's, it's wonderful. So this is what you see here. The text is the SVG format. This is the, the contents of this SVG file. And this file defines this image. You see it in the background. Um, so like, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. But what's actually going on here is just these four lines here is what's the, the, the important part. Um, those are defining that they're saying the first line is saying that there's going to be a, a box in the background in blue color. And the second line is saying there's going to be another rectangle at the bottom uh, with some gradient on it. The other one is the, the shape of the stop sign. And then uh, it says stop on it and all that stuff. So. Um, you might think, hey, we, we talked about vectors last time. This doesn't look like vectors to me. Why are you calling it vector images? Well, vectors are actually hidden here a little bit, right? So um, if you look at these lines, there are a whole bunch of numbers here. Those numbers are the coordinates of the vectors that are used for defining these shapes. So for, um, for the... Um, octagon shape here uh, for the stop sign. Uh, these the, the positions of its its vertices are listed here as x y coordinates. So those are the vector coordinates. All that stuff is the, the thing that's that's sort of re related and, and necessary for defining the image. Like the the color of the stop sign is supposed to be red. Its its borders are supposed to be white. The thickness of the border is supposed to be something. All all that. All that's, stuff is uh, defined up here. But what's, what's important here is the vector stuff, and that's why this is called a vector image. So SVG is just one vector image format. There are a whole bunch of vector image formats. But this is uh, probably the, the, the most popular format used today. And the nice thing about it is it's just the, it's a text file. It's a human readable text file. It's basically a form of XML file. Uh, so you can actually, I hand wrote parts of this, um, and then you can do that. So uh, that's the nice thing about the SVG files. Again, I would highly recommend it. Use it when you need vector images. But today's topic is not vector images. Right? We you use vector images in computer graphics. Um, we use vector stuff a lot in computer graphics. But today's topic is going to be more specifically about raster images. Now, when we think about raster images, that's when we get pixels, right? So raster images are made out of pixels. Pixels are picture elements. That's why I'm calling them pixels, right? So a, a raster image will be formed by a whole bunch of pixels like this. Uh, they're typically um, they're typically defined in a scanline order, from from left to right, um, and from top to bottom. Uh, and each one of these pixels will have a color associated with them. And th this whole thing uh, combined would form the image that we see. So this is what we call a raster image, right? 
So each pixel is storing a color value. All right. So um, this doesn't look like much because this is a very low resolution image. <laughs> Uh, it's an 8x8 eight eight image, not very high resolution. Here's what I mean by resolution. The, the, the width and the height of the image in pixels would define the, the resolution of the image. Right? So when you say image resolution, this is what we're talking about, width times height. That's the basically determines the number of pixels. Right? Uh, so as you see, Besides resolution, what's really important here is colors. So let's talk about colors a little bit, All right? This is our next topic. Now, when, when I say color, probably many of you are thinking, oh, I know what color is. Yeah, a lot of people think that they know what color is, but actually most people have no idea what color is, or they have a very, very wrong idea about what color is. Uh, so, what do you guys think when you say color? You think RGB or something else? I don't know. All right, let, let me try to explain color a little bit. I'm not gonna explain in a lot of detail. Color is actually a very, very complicated topic. But today, I, I'm just gonna briefly overview what, what color is in very, very broad strokes, right? <laughs> RGBA opacity, right? <laughs> no, no, no. We're starting with this. We're starting with light and light visible light spectrum so here light is an electromagnetic wave right it has a whole bunch of possible wavelengths so part of these wavelengths of light are in the visible spectrum so if the light has these wavelengths we can actually see the light but anything that has lower wavelengths that is infrared or um, sorry larger wavelengths or smaller wavelengths uh, ultraviolet, we won't be able to see those lights, right? So we have a limited range of, uh, of, of lights uh, we, can, we can see. Now, I um, might be able to say wavelength or, or frequency. They're basically related. Um, frequency is one over wavelength. Uh, so if I say one or the other, don't, don't worry about it. So larger wavelength means uh, lower frequency and smaller wavelength means higher frequency. Right, so this is the spe light spectrum that that we see. Uh, but when you look at some light that that you see, you're not going to see just one of these. And an actual light that you see will be a combination of a whole bunch of frequencies. This is very much like audio signals. Audio signals will be combined of a whole bunch of frequencies. Light is very much the same. So, for example. Here is the, the, the spectrum generated from uh, some, a particular LED light. So as you see, it's not producing just one particular light frequency. It's, it's producing a whole bunch of wavelengths with different amplitudes. So certain wavelengths are more pronounced than the others. So when you look at this, you're going to perceive some color from out of this. But what, what, act, what the light actually is, is a, is a collection of all these uh, wavelengths, right? Uh, so what happens when you look at something like this? When you look at this, let's take a look at our eye a little bit. So, so light is entering our eye, and here we have these, these cones, as they call it, with some photoreceptors, and this is where we start seeing stuff. Now, there are different types of cones, uh, there, are, there are cones that perceive color, and those, those cones, actually, we have three types of cones. In this, in this figure, they're highlighted with, with three different colors. Uh, we have, humans have, three different uh, types of cones. And those three different types of cones would form our color perception. So a proper definition of color, I think, would be um, a shared hallucination of our species. And I'm saying hallucination because color does not, is not something that exists in the real world. What exists in the real world is just the, color, the, the light spectrum. Right? Uh, what we perceive is the color. So it's completely perceptual. That's why it's a hallucination. And it's a shared hallucination in our species because we all, well, most of us, have these three different cones. So we can see certain types of colors and sort of we agree on what to call them, right? 
And this is basically what, what we see out of the real world, but we're not quite seeing exactly what it is. And it is very specific to our species uh, because um, other animals actually have different types of eye structure, different types of cones, and uh, they, they perceive light very, very differently. Uh, some animals can actually perceive color light like we do, but, but different than we do. Some animals have actually more types of cones than we do. Actually, some people even have uh, a, a fourth kind of uh, cone, as far as I know. So this is, this is not, not even, even for human species, it's, it's not really universal. So the whole concept of color is definitely not something universal. It's very much related to how we perceive light. So three different types of cones. Why are they different? Because they have different responses to the light, um, it's some, some light spectrum that enters our eyes. So one of them is more sensitive to, to light that we perceive as blue. One of them is more sensitive to light that we perceive as green. And the other one is sort of more sensitive to light we perceive as reddish, although it has some you know, sensitivity over here as well. So, the, but regardless of what exactly the, the shapes are, basically we're getting three values out of this visual system. It just gives us three color values. Um, I'm seeing some questions. Yeah, all right. So, yeah, the stream is recorded. Uh, so, three values. That means we can sort of generate what a human can perceive as color just using three different colors. Combinations of three different colors, if you carefully pick those three different colors, by, by, with various linear combination of these three different colors, you can actually generate a similar kind of uh, perception for humans. And that's the whole idea behind what we call RGB, right? Red, green, and blue. Uh, so in computer graphics, this is what we use for defining colors. Uh, there, there's a red color, there's a green color, and blue color. Now, um, there are standards for this. Most specifically, most monitors that we use um, use uh, what's called standard RGB, sRGB. Uh, and that means these, these colors have uh, very well-defined values and, and spectra associated with them. But I'm, I'm skipping all those details. Basically, there are three different lights and using the combi combinations of th those three different lights we can get all colors that humans can see uh, not all colors specifically um, that's that's related to the sRGB standard sRGB standard cannot produce all colors we can actually see colors that are sort of outside of this spectrum a little bit uh, but you know let's skip those details for the time being that, that's, that's good enough, actually. It gives us a wide range of colors that, that we can perceive. Um, so as you can see, when you mix all of these colors, when you combine all of them together, this is, that's what we perceive as white in the middle here. Yeah. So if you dim all of these colors, if you dim all of the RGB colors and you all the way down to no light, none whatsoever, it becomes black. So anything between black and white and, and all these colors are formed by the intensities of these color values. All right. So then we can just use uh, some, if you want, you want to represent color values, we have RGB values. And each, for each one of these R, G, and B, the red, green, and blue values, we can represent them as a, a, a range between zero and one. Zero meaning no light, one being maximum light, right? Um, so this is a you know, standard mathematical notation for, um, for the range zero to one, including zero and one. That's very important. Zero and one must be included uh, because Zero, zero, zero will be black for us. White, one, one, one will be white over here, right? And red is one, zero, zero. Green is zero, one, zero. Blue is zero, zero, one, and so forth. So basically, this is forming a coordinate system for us. It's like a 3D coordinate system. Red is one 
coordinate direction, green is another coordinate direction, and blue is another coordinate direction. So we can actually visualize color as an as a cube like this, right? So black is here at the at the back that we, we can't see on the far end of this this cube, and and white is closer up here um, in, in the middle when all the colors combine, right? And so red, and, and if you combine red and blue, you get over here. If you combine red and green, you're up here and so forth. So this is our RGB color space, and this is the color space that we will be working with. Good. Now, here's the question, though. Now, if this is black, 0, 0, 0, and this is white, then tell me, what is this? <laughs> sunlight is a lot brighter than the light that I'm going to get from my monitor, but that was like the maximum 111. What happened over here? Okay, so here's the thing. This white that we call white is the maximum light that our typical monitors can generate. That's what we call white. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the sunlight would be a lot brighter, right? So uh, this, um, this range between 0 and 1 for typical monitors, we call this low dynamic range, LDR. And mo most monitors that we use today will be LDR monitors. Um, this, if you start including light intensities that are even brighter than the definition of white, that's going to be high dynamic range. Right? Uh, and today, we have high dynamic range displays um, that they can presumably generate really, really bright light. Of course, not as bright as the sun, not even close, but, you know, brighter than what 111 is supposed to be. So they give you a whole, uh, a lot, whole lot more range than what you would get from low dynamic range displays. Right? And this is important because that's going to impact how we store color and how we store raster images. It's all going to be related. All right, so going back, I have values. If I have low dynamic range and I'm storing low dynamic range images, um, there are various options, the various ways that I can store it. A, a typical way of storing them would be instead of storing a floating point value per color channel, I would use 8 bits to represent them. So I'm going to quantize the range between 0 and 1 and split it into 256 quantized units between 0 and 255. Um, so in this, in this range, 0 would mean 0, obviously, and 255 would mean 1. Right? Uh, and that's how I would represent all possible intensity values for each one of my R, G, and B uh, color channels. Uh, this is the most commonly used format uh, today, and most image formats would be actually using this 8-bit uh, color channels. And there, there's a reason for that, actually. It turns out, if you do this right, um, and I'm going to talk about what I mean by doing this right um, in the, during the next lecture. If you do this right, 8-bit is actually sufficient. Uh, and, and it's very, very hard, if possible at all, for us to see the difference between color values uh, be, uh, between these uh, quantized steps. So if your monitor is properly calibrated, uh, you should barely see the difference between these quantized units of 256 values. Um, so this is sufficient, but a lot of times, um, a lot of times we do also sort of manipulations to images. Uh, so when you generate an image and you're going to modify it, you're going to change the color values a little bit, maybe you're going to draw something on it, you're going to do all sorts of things with it. it because, I mean, they are sufficient now, but if you start modifying it, this quantization can hurt you later on. Because if I take an image and then I say, oh, I'm just going to make this image brighter, take all the color values, multiply them by two. All of a sudden, my quantization levels were multiplied by two, right? So I'm, I'm losing information if I use this, this type of quantization for images that I'm going to modify later on. So because of that, I might want to use more, more precision. Uh, and, 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 I, and we typically use for those kinds of uh, LDR images 16 bits. And then 16 bits 
would give you quite a lot of precision, uh, way more than we can perceive. So they, you know, they hold up pretty well in uh, image manipulation as well. So if you're dealing with low dynamic range images, these 8 bits per channel or 16 bit per channel would be sufficient. And for most images that are designed for us to just consume, that's, for example, uh, this, the images that we see on our web pages or the, the videos that we watch, all that stuff is going to be just using 8 bits per channel because that's sufficient for just consuming without manipulation. All good? Now, if we need high dynamic range, however, now things get a little more complicated because, you know, how high dynamic range are we talking about? Right? It's beyond one, we're not contained within the, this, this finite range anymore. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, it becomes reasonable to store colors, color channels using more bits. So we could use 32 bits, in which case it's going to be full float. Then we can use um, IEEE floating point format and, uh, and you know, we're familiar with it and, and it's done. Actually, for a lot of computations that we do in computer graphics, uh, we're going to use 32-bit floating point values for representing colors. So during our computer graphics computations, this is what we're going to be using. And once we are done manipulating color, once we say, okay, we've computed the color, this is going to be displayed for this pixel, that's when we take this value and we convert it to um, the corresponding uh, LDR value. Right? And of course, we're going to have to um, chop it off if needed, if it's greater than one, we're going to have to uh, collect that part. Uh, so this is what we're going to be using. Uh, and, and this is used for, for uh, image storage as well. But for image storage, of course, it takes a lot of space. So sometimes people prefer using 16-bit float. Because the thing is, 32-bit floats, they can represent very large values. And we don't really need that much large values, right? I mean, we're not going to be concerned with the intensity of the sunlight too much anyway. Uh, so 16-bit floats, for, for a lot of cases, it's sufficient. Actually, I'm going to talk about briefly about some L, uh, high dynamic range storage. Uh, and, and they use more complicated structures to, to compress the, the, the storage down a little bit. All right. So let's talk about how we're storing these raster images. There are two general ways of storing color information. Uh, we can use the, we can store them in interleaved format where each pixel will have its own RGB color stored next to each other. RGB, 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 like in a, for example, in a scan line order. And if I do that, then I don't need to know anything about anything else about that image. I just need to know its width and height. Actually, I probably just need to know its width. Um, and, and then I can just store RGB colors one after the other for each pixel, and that's going to be my image. So that's a very typical way of storing images. Most displays will, will be using this, this sort of an interleaved format. Uh, and actually, the, the image format that you guys will, 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 will get in that uh, JavaScript function in our first project is going to be stored in this interleaved format. It's going to be colors RGB, 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 RGB. So this looks like a 2D array of color values, but you can also think about this as like a 1D array, and it's typically stored as 1D array. And if I know the width of an image, the width resolution, then I can tell based on the index of a, a, a color, I can tell where it is in this 2D plane, right? So you know, using the scan line order, each color value is going to get its, its, its own ID. Uh, another way of storing images is going to be, as you see here, it's going to be as separate channels. This can be used in some cases. Sometimes maybe you want to mo modify or manipulate the, the red channels or green channel independently. Uh, or do some different manipulations with it. So it, in some software, sometimes they prefer storing color this way. And there are actually uh, image file formats that will store color this way. But this is um, less common. And, and there are reasons for that, because for a lot of colored images, the, the RGB values that we 
we, uh, we get in an image will be sort of related to each other. They're not going to be completely independent. Uh, so storing them together uh, would allow you to get better, better compression when you're using compression. But you know, if you're just keeping them in memory, this is you can you can use either one, whichever one makes sense. I'll, I'll talk about this in a bit more detail later on. So let's talk about some popular raster image formats. Well, I'm I'm laughing here because uh, yeah, this is sort of popular, but not really. Back in the day, it was sort of popular. So bitmap and portable. <laughs> Portable text map image files, uh, BMP and PPM image files. These are the, probably the simplest image formats. Actually, PPM is probably the simplest image raster image uh, format. It's it has a super simple um, header file. Just just uh, just requires you to to write the the resolution of the image, and then you dump all the RGB data, and you're pretty much done. <laughs> it's very very simple. Um, and these image formats, what's important about them is obviously they are LDR formats, so they're not going to store high dynamic range images. And the, the images they store are going to be uncompressed. So they're going to store these RGB, 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 RGB values. All right? Uh, and those RGB values could be, use, could be using just a single bit per channel, in which case it's going to be a black and white image. Um, or it could be using like eight bits, or typically they will use eight bits or sixteen bits, as, as we talked about. And these image formats are actually not all that popular. And I'm saying popular raster image formats because they they are sort of used. There are so many image raster image formats over the years. All sort of camera manufacturers came up with their own image formats with different compression schemes and all that. Uh, so I'm, I have no intention of going through all of them. And totally unnecessary too, uh, but I'm just going to talk about the, the important ones. And I'm listing these because they store uh, images as uncompressed. So these are as simple as it gets in terms of image storage. Now, if you want to compress images, and believe me, you want to compress images, <laughs> uh, PNG is a modern uh, graphics format. Uh, portable graphics format is what's called. Uh, it does. Um, lossless compression. So I'm going to take an image and it's going to compress it uh, using uh, different, it, it can use a zip compression or uh, a, a, another type of compression. Uh, regardless, it will be able to reproduce this image exactly when you uncompress it. So PNG images will be used for storing files on a disk or um, you know, sending files over network but once you receive the file, or once you read the file from the disk, you're going to uncompress it, um, and then uh, and, and then you're going to display it as an uncompressed format. You're going to store it as an uncompressed format. You're going to send it to your display device uh, in an uncompressed format. All right. And again, these are designed for LDR images, uh, and they can be six or uh, sorry, eight or sixteen bits per channel, or or, or alternatively, they can store color tables. So, and this is kind of important. Now, I'm saying lossless compression, but if you use a color table, you're going to lose stuff. So here's how it is. A, a color table, when you use a color table, you're not going to store red, green, and blue channels per pixel. Instead, you're going to store a color table with 2 to 2, uh, 256 colors in that color table uh, and within uh, and then for each pixel you're just going to store the index of that color in this color table right so if you have a lot of pixels and very few colors this becomes super efficient if i have like i don't know four different colors in my image and i have a very very high resolution image i might as well just store the the index of that color and that's going to compress really well as well, so it uh, it's, makes a lot more sense. So the important thing here to know is that PNG files are lossless unless you're using a color table. If you're using a color table, you're first going to quantize your colors to fit into those color, uh, colors in your color table. You may have a lot more than 256 different colors in your image. 
So first you're going to pick the nearest color in the color table, uh, and then uh, and then the rest of the compression is going to be lossless. Um, and it's important to note that the, the color tables are stored separately uh, per PNG image. So it, there isn't a standard color table that every PNG image uses. Uh, this, these 256 colors will be, or however many colors you're using for your PNG image, they will be generated specifically for your image. All right, so that's how we use uh, color tables. And I'm talking about these color tables a lot because another very popular file format, uh, graphics interchange format, that's GIF, also uses uh, color tables. And these color tables, in this case, can be 2 to 256 colors. And this is a much older uh, file format, uh, raster image file format. It has been very, very popular. Actually, um, World Wide Web made it, or shall I say Internet, made it very, very popular uh, back in the day. That was a very popular file format. Uh, it still is used very, very extensively uh, in, on, it, on the, over the Internet today. Uh, but probably PNG images are more popular. Um, so it's using a similar uh, compression scheme. Uh, uh, so after you quantize, it's, it's using a lossless compression scheme. Um, so a part of the compression comes from this, using this color table by reducing the, the bits you will need for storing uh, each pixel. And the other one is coming from this uh, compression scheme that this, uh, this particular file format uh, implements. All right, so these are typical um, common file formats used for storing uh, images in, in a lossless form, you know, modulo the, the, the color quantization if you're using a color table. Uh, a very, very popular um, image file format is JPEG. Joint Photographic Expert Group um, generated the, this format back in the day. Uh, this uses, JPEG uses lossy compression. Uh, now, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not planning to explain all the details of how JPEG compression works uh, because it, I don't think it's too important, but it's kind of under, it's kind of important to understand that it is the lossy compression. That means JPEG images cannot be uncompressed and, 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 and uh, in, in a way that would uh, exactly reproduce the original image. So you take an image with an RGB sequence in, let's say, scanline form, and you compress it as a JPEG image. When you when you read it off again, you're not going to get the same image anymore. You're going to lose some information. That's why we call it lossy. And there's a reason for this. By using lossy compression, JPEG images can compress images can co compress image information quite significantly. So a, a JPEG image would be much smaller than an uncompressed image. How much? Well, we'll see. Uh, and typically, JPEGs use, typically, JPEGs use 8 bits per color shell. So, okay, let's take, let's take a look at how these different formats fare. All right, so here's a low resolution uh, teapot image. That's, that's our uh, graphics lab logo. Uh, saved as a BMP uncompressed bitmap file format, it, it, this one takes, it's a very, very small low resolution image. And it takes 146 kilobytes. Now very large, but for a small image, that's actually pretty sizable. Um, if I just use PNG compression in this image, and PNG is not going to lose anything, it's going to look identical. I'm switching to PNG, it's going to look identical, it is identical, it's lossless. All of a sudden, it's 5 kilobytes. From, you know, going back from 146, I'm going all the way down to 5 kilobytes. So this compression can make a huge difference. Um, so what happens if I use JPEG? Now, I'm first going to show you a very low quality JPEG. JPEG has some quality knob that you can, you can adjust. I'm going to show you a very low quality JPEG, and I'm warning you, it's not going to look good. You ready? It's going to look pretty bad. Here it is. So, oh, these really awful things. 
And here's what's going on here. Let me tell you just a little bit about JPEG compression. So what, what it typically does is that it takes these eight by eight blocks of pixels and within each eight by eight block, um, without getting into too much detail as, as broad strokes, strokes um, it will basically store the average color for that block and then it will store some, uh, for each pixel it will store the differences from that average color. And because it's storing differences from that average color, you can encode those differences with very few bits, and that's where a lot of the compression comes from. So it doesn't need to store eight bits per color channel. It's using very, very few bits. And you can adjust how many bits are being used. If, if it's a very low quality JPEG, this quality set to zero here. That doesn't mean zero bits. It's just the lowest quality. That's what it means. Uh, you get, get something that looks uh, really bad. So if you crank up the quality, in this case, like medium quality, you get something that looks a little bit better. Uh, so depending on the quality of the stream that you're, you're, you're getting, either through Zoom or YouTube, you should be able to see these JPEG compression artifacts. But if I crank it up and go to 10, maybe some of you are seeing it. If you're careful, maybe others are not seeing it quite. But they are there. They're, this is not perfect. And it's not going to be perfect because this file format is not designed to be lossless. It's going to be lossy. So there's still going to be some artifacts around these, um, these, these sharp uh, edges. All right. Well, what if I use GIF? All right, let, let's, let, let's go back here. Actually, I forgot to highlight some important detail here. All right, all the way to bitmap. Now, 146 kilobytes to five kilobytes in lossless PNG compression, right? Now, I'm going to low quality, horrible looking JPEG and it looks, it, 17 kilobytes. Yay! I mean, I'm losing image quality and storage. So it seems completely useless. And it is useless in this case because this is not a good image for JPEG. This is a very bad image for JPEG compression. Um, I'll show you other examples where JPEG is going to do a lot better than this. But here it's not good. And if you crank up the quality, of course, you're going to need more and more bits. <laughs> Yeah, you know, things are better, but now I have a larger file. It's not even worth it. Now, if I go back to GIF compression, and with GIF, I'm using just 16 colors and 3 kilobytes. No artifacts. It looks just fine. All right. I, there, are, there is color quantization here because the original image had more than 16 colors. I mean, you're saying, where are these 16 colors? I'm seeing white and red. Uh, there are colors in between here around the edges. Some pixels have colors between white and red. Um, so we had something like um, 48 colors or something in this image, I believe, something like that. Uh, and we quantize them to 16, but you can't even tell the difference. Let me show you the, the original one. This is lossless. This is quantized version. I mean, you can't see the difference, right? 16 colors in this case turns out it's good enough. So that's why the GIF images are still used a lot today. And PNG file format supports color quantization. So you can get the same, same level of uh, compression with PNG as well. All right. Now, OK, for this example, JPEG did not do so well. But it's not always going to be like this. So here's another example. Uh, here you see that there's a lossless PNG. Um, PNG on your left side. Uh, and on the right, we have the, the JPEG compression, image with JPEG compression, with quality set to zero. I should have said JPEG here. Yeah, this is JPEG quality zero. All right. So, yes, I mean, JPEG quality zero is not great. When you compare these two images, you should be able to see some differences and some compression artifacts here. Uh, it's not immediately as obvious as before, though. If Teapot was terrible, this is not as terrible. And the image file is actually significantly smaller in this case. Because the compression algorithm, losses compression of PNG, cannot do such a good job for this particular image. Yeah. But it is, it is terrible. It's pretty bad. So let's crank it up. Let's, let's go to medium quality. When you switch to medium quality, it's a, it's a little bit better. Definitely better. Fewer artifacts. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but of course, we kind of paid with some extra storage. We went up to 15 kilobytes, but still 
better than PNG. If you crank it up more, go all the way to 10, uh, we get 22 kilobytes. Actually, 10 is not the maximum quality. Photoshop will allow you to set the quality to uh, 12. Uh, for those of you who haven't used Photoshop, it's a, um, it's a professional photo editing uh, and image manipulation software. And it will allow you to save JPEGs with quality 12. That's going to use even more bits and better quality, obviously. Uh, so in this case, it's going to be very, very hard to tell the difference between these two images, right? Because JPEG compression with quality set to 10 is doing a very good job. Uh, and the image is much smaller than PNG. So depending on the type of image, JPEG compression may make sense or not. So you kind of need to know what kind of image you're using. And based on what kind of image you're using, what kind of image, what kind of image data you have, uh, you need to pick your file format accordingly. You kind of need to be careful about that. Because these um, different compression algorithms are designed for, for different purposes. Uh, here's one more example that I'm going to show you. Uh, in this image, I have this, this PNG, Im PNG image uh, with lossless compression is 35 kilobytes. Without compression, this would be a, a lot larger, obviously. Uh, but it's a low resolution version of the image on my website. Uh, so with lossless, PNG compression is 35. If I switch to GIF, and this GIF format, you get 60, with 64 colors, uh, you get 8 kilobytes. Yes, it's significantly smaller. But, but I have color quantization artifacts. Can you guys see the color quantization artifacts? So I have only 64 colors. So if a color value is in between two color values in the table, we need to pick one or the other, right? That you can't do anything about that. But one thing that, um, that uh, most software that uh, converts images to this format uh, do is that they don't blindly convert each pixel completely independently. Uh, they look at the neighboring pixels and the error made in the neighboring pixels, and they sort of try to keep the average error minimum. Here's what I mean by that. Now, I have a particular color value. I don't have that color value in my color table. I have one color value. I, have, I look at the closest color values. I have one that is slightly brighter. I have one that is slightly darker. Now I'm going to pick one or the other. Right? I have to pick one or the other. I can't do anything else. Um, so if I always pick the brighter one for all of the colors, when I convert my image to, to, to this format, the image will look just brighter right? because of color quantization. If I always pick the lower one, the image will look darker. So what these algorithms will, will do is that they're going to keep the average brightness the same. And they're going to do this uh, sort of by considering each color channel, obviously. Uh, so they're going to keep the average error in the, in the neighborhood uh, as small as possible. Uh, this is what we call error dithering. So as they're converting them, uh, as they're quantizing the image, they're going to accumulate the error and they're going to use that error to, to decide which nearby quantized color value to go whenever they have to quantize the, the neighboring pixels. So the, the result of that is when you have um, regions with in between colors, you're going to see a whole bunch of pixels that are switching between two different colors. So if, if you, uh, I cannot show you or you look over here, maybe there are colors in between two color values uh, or like on the cheek, uh, there are going to be colors between two color values. Uh, and those are, you're going to see some pixels switching to one color, neighbor pixel switching to the other color. So if you look at it from a distance and you cannot make out each pixel individually, um, this will give you the perception of that average color. This actually works out pretty well when you have a high resolution display. But here I'm just blowing up all these pixels so you can see the differences. That, that, you know, that, that's why it's kind of uh, kind of looks bad. It's, that, because this image is actually very, very tiny. All right. So this is... What happened when I moved from lossless PNG compression to the GIF with 64 colors only? Now, if I use JPEG here, 
and I'm going to set the JPEG quality such that I'm going to get the same file size, more or less. And it's going to look like ready, and it's going to look like this. So from here to here. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it is so much better if you ask me. Yeah, in some places it has JPEG compression artifacts. Uh, here you can see some JPEG compression artifacts here and there. But in a lot of places, I'm getting in between color values, and JPEG is doing a, a, a lot better job at that. Um, the top here. You should be able to see some uh, quantization artifacts right around here. Um, but overall, it's, do it's doing well. Um, but, you know, don't undermine the, the GIF file for format because it's actually very, very good for other things as well. And one of the things that's used very, very frequently, um, especially uh, on the web, but sometimes during presentations, is animations. Uh, because this, this your file format supports animations as well. Uh, and the way that this is going to work is that uh, basically it's, it's storing a, a bunch of different images uh, with different timings, and it's displaying those images either in a loop or maybe it just plays once. Uh, you, can, you can set it up in various ways. Uh, for pretty much all the animations, all the image-based animations you see, uh, unless they're recorded as videos, they're going to be uh, the animated jet. Now, a PNG file format also support animation. Uh, there's an animated PNG format. It's a little bit different. Um, so it's not as widely supported. Uh, this file format has been around for decades. So it's pretty much supported everywhere. Uh, but the animation with PNG, uh, even though the file format supports, it's, it's not supported by um, all browsers. So it's not as commonly used because of that. All right, so enough about, enough about LDR file formats. Let's talk about HDR file formats. Um, there aren't as many HDR file formats because HDR is a relatively new concept uh, because back in the day when people were worried about image file formats, uh, every bit was important. Storage was very expensive. Internet was slow. So, uh, you know, we, we couldn't even think about say, oh, I want to have more and more bits and per pixel, but that was beyond anyone's dreams and they didn't care. Um, but then, you know, for, for certain tasks, people actually needed image file formats that stored full color information. Uh, well, more specifically, uh, Industrial Light and Magic, um, ILM, uh, ILM uh, came up with this uh, specific format, Open EXR format, or EXR format. Uh, this, this format is designed for storing HDR images. It can use uh, 16 or 32 bits per channel. Um, and it can use lossy or lossless compression. Uh, and these images are uh, used for film production because in film production, you, you end up doing a lot of image manipulation. So you take images and, and you modify them. Uh, and we said, you know, going from 8 bits to 16 bits was good enough. Why are you thinking about 32 bits now? Why are you talking about HDR? It's actually needed for HDR because we don't want clipping at all. So when you're generating an image, it, and it turns out your color values are brighter than white for whatever reason because of your computation, you don't want to lose that information when you save the file to when you save that image to disk. Uh, that's why they they have been using this this format. And this is not the only uh, high dynamic range uh, image format. There are others, uh, but this is a, a very popular one. That's why I'm talk specifically talking about this. And there are different ways of storing um, high dynamic range images because these are going to be a lot more expensive, right? So just going from 8 bits to 32 bits, you're going to quadruple your data, right? But it's not just that. Uh, turns out you can compress 8-bit images, 8-bit uh, per color channel images, a lot better than high dynamic range images. So the compression algorithms are not going to work as well for these uh, for these as well 
and that, that's, that's uh, another reason why these um, HDR images are more expensive. But they are definitely used, they have their own use cases in, in computer graphics, especially in film production. Uh, they are very, very popular because you don't want to lose any information there when you're like, imagine that it took you uh, hours and hours to generate an image, and then you render a, a video that contained a thousand images like this. <laughs> you don't want to lose that information when you save it to this because you know maybe you'll you'll need it for something, and and if you don't have that, you're gonna have to view That's that's really expensive. Storage today is not that expensive, so it's it's okay. All right, I'm almost done for today, but I want to talk about one more thing before before I end it. Uh, so typically, when we're um, when we read images from a disk, or or when we receive images image files uh, on the internet in our browser that displaying them, they're going to take those images, they're going to take those compressed images, and they're going to convert them into an uncompressed um, string of um, bytes of RGB values. Uh, and this is what's going to be sent to our display. So even if we are getting an image that is using 16 bits per, per channel, um, you know, I might be intermediately storing them as 16 bits per channel, but at the end of the day, when I'm pushing it to my display to, to show it, uh, I'm going to use 8 bits per channel, and that's how I'm going to send it to my uh, display. I'm, nice. I'm using a high dynamic range display. Uh, and they're going to be typically stored in this interleaved format, and they're going to be using this scan line uh, order. So that's a typical way of storing images. And this is exactly uh, the, the way that images will be stored for uh, our project in the scan line order. Uh, but turns out this is not the most efficient way of storing images for certain algorithms. Uh, for a lot of 3D computer graphics applications, uh, we're going to be looking at images and we're going to be manipulating images in local regions. So it makes sense to think about an image as like a 2D construct instead of this, this 1D scan line. Um, because pixels right above and below each other in scan line can be very far away in memory. Uh, and that's bad because for a lot of graphics algorithms, if I'm accessing a pixel, I'm probably going to access its horizontal neighbors and vertical neighbors too, for, for a lot of algorithms. So it kind of makes sense to put them close by in memory so I get much better cache efficiency and so forth. And because of that, this um, different types of swizzled uh, orders are more popular and uh, especially for GPUs. GPUs will store uh, images uh, oftentimes using a swizzle order like this. Uh, so you can send an, an image in interleaved format from your CPU to your GPU and the GPU will get it and swizzle it and that's how it's going to store it because it's going to be a lot more efficient for a lot of algorithms. So this is um, a typical swizzling order uh, that's used a lot, it's, the, it's what's called a Z curve. Here, uh, I'm following this, this Z shape. And it's like a fractal. You, you basically follow the same shape here, and then go same shape here, and same shape here. And overall, at the high level, I ended up using the same Z, but a larger Z, right? And if you look at a collection of uh, pixels here, I'm, I'm drawing a bigger Z. Right? So that, that is the, the Z curve. Again, this is just one swizzling order. Uh, because of the, the way that caches are, um, are used, actually, at this lower level, it doesn't make too much sense to swizzle these, these four pixels together because they're going to be in the same cache line. It doesn't matter how you store them. Uh, so it, so this, this, at the very low end, the this, this swizzling can be disabled. So th there are different ways of using do, doing swizzling. Uh, that, that's all I'm trying to communicate here. This is not the only way of doing swizzling, but when I say swizzling, Typically, this is what people imagine. Um, and the important point here is to understand that the, the scanline order is just one order of storing these images. They can be stored in different ways as well. But in memory, the images are not going to be stored in comp compressed formats, not, not in, uh, in PNG compression, with, with PNG compression, 
or with with uh, JPEG compression. So that they are going to be uncompressed in in memory because we're going to be manipulating them. That being said, there are other compression algorithms that are suitable for uh, real time image manipulation. So GPUs GPUs use a lot of image compression, uh, but they're going to be using different image compression algorithms, not the same image compression algorithms we use for storing the images to disk. Right? And I'm going to briefly touch on them later on, uh, just probably briefly. Uh, I think suffice it to say that image compression happens on the GPUs, um, um, and sometimes they're even hidden. Uh, GPUs will compress anything losslessly. If they can have lossless compression, they'll just use it because you won't know that they're compressed uh, and they can get the benefits of compression. Uh, but for lossy compression, of course, they kind of need to be a bit more careful. Um, all right, so I'm going to stop today's lecture here. I used almost our entire uh, allocated uh, class time. Uh, so I'm going to stop here and I'm going to say, do you guys have any questions about all of the stuff that we talked about? Maybe I should follow the chat a little more carefully. Um, are there differences between separate formats, mainly how the colors are stored or what colors the algorithms consider important? Uh, so. The algorithms, the, the image compression algorithms, uh, at least none of the ones that I know, uh, they're not sensitive to the the color that you're you're storing. They 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 can pretty much store any color. Of course, if you're storing a color table, there's going to be a limited number of colors. Um, but they are they can be more sensitive to how the colors are changing. For example, for um, for JPEG. Uh, for, for, for JPEG, if the nearby color values are similar uh, in an 8x8 eight eight neighborhood, uh, JPEG does a much better job in compressing them. Uh, but if you have sharp boundaries like, oh, I have this red piece here, and then all of a sudden I have this white piece here, this, this sharp changes JPEG can't, can't really handle well. Um, but for formats like PNG or, or GIF or GIF, they, they, uh, they are very good at compressing um, constant colors. If I have a constant value, they're very, very good at compressing those. And that's how they can get better compression than JPEG, because JPEG can't do as good a job in, for constant values. Uh, so they are sensitive to the color information, but they're not selective in, in terms of what kind of color values they, they, they would like to uh, compress. Uh, when a computer screen displays black, does that mean that RGB uh, LEDs for that pixel are all off? Uh, they're supposed to be, uh, but not always. Uh, so you know, there are different different uh, technologies used for displays. Uh, sometimes we have a, a backlight that gives you most of the light, and there are pixels that are sort of blocking the light. Uh, using different forms of uh, uh, polarization. Uh, so if yeah, if your uh, display is set up such that you have this uh, giant LED array in the back forming the backlight, uh, then you know your pixels will try to block that light, but they may not be able to block all of the light. So that's why when your com computer monitors are on. Even if you're displaying a black screen, it's not going to look pitch black. You will still get some light most of the time. Uh, but some more smart displays will actually shut off that LED. Some of them will uh, shut off parts of those backlights. Uh, so it, it varies from, from display to display. Uh, do you formats with different amounts, amounts bits uh, for each other? For each color channel exists. Uh, yes, there are formats. Uh, there are ways to uh, store different color channels with different numbers of bits. Because uh, turns out certain colors, well, three yeah, three color channels. Turns out green is more important than red and blue, uh, because a lot of our light sensitivity 
and it comes from green. So it kind of makes sense to allocate more bits to green sometimes. But for various reasons, you may want to allocate more bits. Uh, actually, there, there are some image manipulations happening on your displays uh, as well. And uh, so uh, some displays use uh, 10 bits, for example, for representing colors. Even though their input is 8 bit per pixel, they're going to operate it to 10 bits and do some image manipulation so that, uh, so that when they were displaying it, they're not going to uh, lose data. So there are a whole bunch of uh, different formats, and and you know uh, the number of bits you have may vary from color channel to color channel. Um, any other questions? Um, and, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, with HDR storage versus LDR storage. So you mm -hmm. know when we're storing in eight bits versus you know thirty two bits, like what? What's the difference in what is being stored? Is it just a higher range of numbers? So we want it brighter, or are they just more specific color uh, accuracy? It's more about well, LDR and HDR. If you just look, think about LDR and HDR, it's about uh, eliminating clipping. So with LDR images, white is the brightest. And if you want to go beyond white, you can't. Uh, with HDR images, you can go beyond white. Well, you won't be able to display it if you're displaying it on an LDR display, but your image data is going to have that information. So if you're changing your image uh, intensities, then uh, you'll be able to start seeing it. So you're, you're preserving that data, you're not destroying that data, even though you're not seeing it. And that's what's important for LDR versus HDR. Uh, the other important thing is, of course, the uh, storing uh, more information, uh, in, more in between color values within the range 0 to 1. But this is, I believe, less important because if you're just storing, if you're just using 16 bits per color channel uh, and all of your colors are LDR 0 to 1, 16 bits is really more than sufficient for, for almost anything. Oh, okay. So, like, let's say LDR using 8 bits versus LDR using 16 bits, the max value for both of them is basically the same thing. Exactly, yes. Oh, okay. okay. Just the quantization is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Yes. Yeah. In, in one of them, you're splitting it into two, 256 different values. Uh, in the other one, you're splitting it into uh, 64K values. Uh, all right, I'm going to end it here then. I'll um, see you next time on Thursday, and we're going to talk about talk more about raster images. Bye for Thank now. You. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.